I'm the uh, Terry Moran mentioned earlier by Gary Banks, um, and um, I wasn't here yesterday or last night, and I'll touch on something that I think Jennifer Westacott mentioned and uh, remark on that fact when I get there. But um, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be on the stage with Jenny and Andrew, and Jenny and I had a bit of a chat beforehand about reform, and I agree with everything that you've said, uh, so I don't know how you're going to get a, a debate going between the two of us uh, later on. And of course, Andrew has made a very wise uh, career move uh, from Canberra to uh, the Premier's Depart in Victoria, Department in Victoria, and both of us today are being reminded of the delights of a crisp morning in the middle of winter in Canberra. Um, could I briefly, very briefly mention the context for my remarks? Um, firstly, that major structural change in the Australian economy is inevitable, needed, and it has to happen. And secondly, fiscal consolidation is necessary and it will happen. And I would agree with Jenny's remark that we need to be going further, faster than we often think is the appropriate uh, rate of change when we debate these things in Australia. And I don't accept the argument, although I won't expand on this in my remarks, that in any sense the Federation is an obstacle to going further, faster. We've got plenty of examples over um, 25 or 30 years of the Federation working effectively with all the ducks in a row and very big reform being agreed and implemented very quickly. However, I would also say that to achieve reform going further and going faster, um, we must face the possibility that the Australian Public Service as it is, is not fit for purpose. And again, I won't go too far into that topic, other than by implication uh, on some fronts, but I'm happy to be tested on that uh, contention when we come to the discussion later. Um, I think, although I'll reflect a bit on the past, we should also focus on what now needs to be done rather than just lamenting the problems of the past. So to present uh, a dirge is not enough. I'll go from that and finish with some brief reasons for guarded optimism about the future. My first reflection is the way ministers have changed. And that change, I think, is a combination of change in the media industry, the growing power and ubiquity of the digital economy and what comes through it, and the disintegration of formal party structures in Australia and the evaporation of the traditional membership base that the major parties used to enjoy. And I think these things have changed ministers, and I didn't anticipate fully enough or fast enough uh, the way in which it did. <clears throat> early in my career, and I started in Canberra somewhat earlier than Andrew, but I won't burden you with the dates, um, I, I acquired a view of ministers which shaped much of how I approached my job thereafter. I was not so much naive as perhaps a little optimistic in forming a view of how ministers approached their life within government as distinct from acknowledging the battlefields of adversarial politics uh, and what it demands. Ministers, I thought, are rational and wise with an assured sense of how community sentiment may be divined and sharpened and shaped. These ministers also knew their own limitations and thus respected professional advice with suggested uh, anticipation, insight and good judgment in those giving it. They could accept occasional failings in their own judgments and in the advice they received. And I've known many such ministers on both sides of politics, indeed too many to name. But if I was pushed, later I might even name a few as examples of what I mean and some of my choices might surprise you a little bit. The mix of capabilities they all possessed varied, but they had a grasp of the arts of governing and the skills in cultivating relationships with the many different groups, including the civil service, upon which they depended for success. Their personalities were such that they could live with occasionally challenging advice from those around them within government, and as much as anything, it was a source of protection for them. Ministers of this type appreciated the art of the long view and were strategic in thought and action. But that was certainly not a description of all the ministers I and probably many in, in this room have worked with. 
In contrast to my perhaps naive ideal, Pat Weller made a useful contribution uh, by describing a fuller ministerial typology some years ago. His list included the maintenance ministers, the spruker ministers, the policy driver ministers, the warrior ministers, and the partisan ministers. And within these five broad stereotypes, my sense is that we now have more of the warrior and partisan classes. And not surprisingly, that shift in ministerial types has been mirrored in the attitudes of people working in ministerial advisors. And I'm not just talking about teenagers either there, Gary. <laughs> and the fact that experience as a ministerial advisor is rapidly becoming a job prerequisite for aspiring politicians means that this not so virtuous circle is becoming complete. My concern is that the relative shallowness of the pool that we are drawing our future political class from makes evidence-based policy reform that much harder and makes the management of government services and programs less impressive than they might be. So my regret is that we should have pushed for a more compelling, continuous and strategic debate of governance issues in recent decades. And our democracy is suffering because of that neglect. My second reflection um, sort of intersects with the first but is a bit different. It's, it's that economics is important but it's not everything. Now this, uh, this is probably going to excite some people in the room, not least uh, the Dean, uh, but we've already squared off on this point before and, and he's prepared to be somewhat tolerant of me in my remarks. Uh, I, I think I didn't recognise early enough the degree to which we were losing broader perspectives on policy challenges, perspectives that go beyond economics. As a guess, a good deal more than 95% <coughs> of public employees are currently engaged in service delivery, program management or regulatory activities. The majority of these employees are at agencies or delivery institutions with some level of independence from departments of state. All told, these public sector employees now make up 16% of the total workforce, which is down from 25%, 25% 30 years ago. With advances in technology, outsourcing of activities, privatisation, private sector providers, co-payments for many services, as well as a bipartisan cap on how much of GDP is available to the public sector at all levels within Australia, um, which is currently around 35% of GDP, the proportion of public sector employees in the total workforce will continue to decline. This has been the work of a generation and the policy establishment transformed itself to get it done. For 30 years, we've been working hard on driving reforms from a macro and micro economic perspective. It's an approach that has generated wealth, opportunity, and choice for more people. But it has come at the cost of public servants and ministers losing sight of how to understand in a profound way the parallel universe of commercial analysis and dealings at the level of individual businesses which are the mainstay of the main economy. This has occurred at a time of massive change in the tools applied and the approaches adopted in the commercial world. I worry that, for many senior public servants, this area of thought is now a black box and that too often our response is that a well-framed market will take care of almost all problems by definition. As a consequence, the commercial universe is very poorly reflected into policy development and thus government is well behind in its view of key influences on economic growth as seen from the perspective of the individual firm. There is a further body of thought and analysis which is important, but left out of what most policy advisors learn, and this I call strategic policy. I'm referring here to evidence-based approaches applied to the complex problems experienced by large organisations. These approaches span management and the formulation of business strategy. There are many techniques already in use in the private sector, widely in use in the private sector, which we should know more about in the public sector. Commercial strategy, business planning, project management, IT and systems, 
capability development, account accountability arrangements, it's a long list. These pro approaches may serve an economic purpose, but they are not derived in a direct fa fashion from the work of economists alone. Rather, they come from the management challenge for various organisations in delivering goods and services in competitive markets. Much of what is behind these approaches has informed many of the key reforms which government in the last 30 years, including those which have reduced the relative size of public sector employment. But the preponderance of economic analysis has meant that Canberra's policy establishment has missed getting the right balance of economics, both macro and micro, advances in contemporary management in the broader sense, but particularly in the light of what's happened in the private sector, and the parallel real world commercial experience of businesses, small and large. In thinking through the challenges facing government as a whole and in preparing advice to ministers. The right balance here is critical to get the settings and strategy right for the more than 90% of public sec servants, public sector employees out there engaged in service delivery and it's also essential to good policy work. And the gap that I'm talking about is aggravated by the increasing feeling that senior public servants who take on advisor positions in ministerial offices are having their cards marked by whoever is in the opposition. Without wanting to sound Rumsfeldian about it, the result is that there are too many unknown unknowns in Canberra and to an extent in the states and territories at the moment as well. Now rather than finish with depressing perhaps thoughts, I want to outline three observations that might make us a little more optimistic about the future. Because the world of the public service has changed massively in 30 years and I don't doubt that it's got the capacity to continue to change. First, it was heartening to read the proposal from the new president of the Business Council of Australia, Catherine Livingston, about closing the gap between what governments think and what business knows. And I think Jennifer Westercott might have said something about this last night when I was doing something else in Melbourne. Her proposal for 20 of Australia's leading companies to offer highly structured secondments for senior public servants with the aim of improving mutual understanding between the public and private sectors is a very positive one. It is a good sign that one of our leading business groups is reaching out to government. Their proposals also go to the real urgency of the economic challenge we face. As part of their secondment proposal, BCA also released some research from McKinsey's which looked at establishing a baseline for, of Australia's comparative advantages. McKinsey's assessment was only, and as some know I'm a senior advisor at Boston Consulting Group, but here I think McKinsey's has, has done good work, I, I should say that. McKinsey's assessment was only five of 19 Australian industry sectors currently have the capacity to grow in a global marketplace. That means that if we only have people in government thinking with an economics perspective and we don't have people with an ability to be able to think strategically about how can we help those 14 other industry sectors build their capacity to grow by doing the things that government can properly do, then we risk leaving future generations a rapidly shrinking economic le legacy. My second reason for optimism is that the growing demand for more open and transparent processes in government is going to force ministers and public servants to lift their game. One of the many things that New Zealand can teach us, apart from an extraordinary competitive dairy industry, is the beneficial effect of shining a bit of sunlight on the internal processes of government. If you go onto a New Zealand government website, you'll be able to see deep departmental briefs to incoming ministers and even prime ministers, a range of cabinet papers, which in many cases are published proactively without FOI requests, and high-level internal briefing documents, including, for example, Treasury documents relating to the design, strategy and ministerial briefing processes of the 2014 budget. I'm prepared to confess to having had a road to Damascus type conversion in my thinking about this area. As some in the room know, I was a fearsome uh, warrior in support of restriction on the release of um, information and think that Sir Humphrey got it right when he spoke of freedom from information. <laughs> but I now think that we seriously lag 
behind our Kiwi co cousins. And in part, my change in thinking reflects some of the concerns I've expressed earlier. A greater level of openness has the potential to create a virtual cir circle, virtuous circle, where ministers are held to account for the strategies they endorse, rather than media-driven gotcha minutiae, and public servants are held to a high standard in the quality and advice that they provide to ministers. It is true that having that level of release puts some extra stress on the ability of public servants to be free, frank and honest in their advice to, to ministers. However, one practical way of meeting that challenge would be to give senior public servants, particularly at the level of departmental heads, the protection of a permanent or long-term fixed appointment, such as uh, happens in some cases. So in Victoria, uh, there's a 10-year appointment for the Ombudsman and a seven-year appointment for the Auditor General, which is almost impossible to revoke. And in that state, uh, as in other jurisdictions, those two people are unusually frank in their views about how things have been going. We need more of that in other parts of the public service. My final reason for optimism is that the tide in governance thinking seems to be flowing in the right direction. As far as I can see it, the long-term future for public sector governance is going to be for service delivery and accountability mechanism processes to be moved closer to the local level. As that happens, what you can think of as the head offices of public sector departments and agencies in Canberra are going to become far less involved in service delivery decisions and far more focused on the six core areas of ministerial responsibility, settling policy, settling strategy, resource allocation through budgets, key <coughs> appointments to agencies and, um, and otherwise, the general performance of the system and engagement with the community. In that world, the service delivery cook cookie jar is put further out of ministerial office reach, which is a better outcome for everyone, ministers included, <clears throat> but it's not a panacea because the strategic advice flowing from departments does still have to be acted upon by ministers and those who advise them from within their private offices. But it will probably make it clearer when it's not being acted on. What we need, in essence, is a little more humility. 220 years ago, Edmund Burke observed a bit caustically that almost any plan could be improved, and I quote, <clears throat> by the observations of those who were much inferior in understanding to the person who took the lead in the business. In other words, the views of ordinary people rather than the views always of people like us. That very old message is one that we need more of our current, from, in our, from our current political leaders, business leaders, and public sector leaders to reflect on. Thank you.